Yeah, dear friends, good afternoon, evening, morning, night, whatever it may be, wherever you are. That fits nicely into this topic because we're going to be looking at the phenomena of day and night and that special little word in the title, into. Because if the more I ponder these phenomena of day and night, the in between times also get very fascinating. So night into day, day into night. And then maybe toward the end, I'll address this question, what makes these nights holy? Once we've established the identity of the day, the identity of the night, and some description of that in between realm that we generally call um, twilight. Oh, we're admitting some more folks here. Oh, yeah. Come on, come all. All right. I want to start with a few words from a psalm. Just to indicate, even that long ago, day and night were particular qualities there in Israel. This is Psalm 90, if you want to look it up later. And just the first few verses. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. The span of their life will be as a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass that changes. For a thousand years in thy sight are <clears throat> as but a watch in the night. It is like yesterday. And there we can get a, a, a kind of a sense of the Almighty or the Eternal One, however one wants to call this divine being. A thousand years in your sight are as yesterday, as a watch in the night. What we could feel as, I don't know if you've ever stayed up and been a night watchman or had a night shift or something like that. They last longer than a day shift of the same length. Eight hours in the night is the, is, is the next shift really coming or is it going? So this being awake in the night is also a very special quality. A thousand years in your sight are as but yesterday when it is past, as a watch in the night, Psalm 90. Ah, table's not quite big enough, see that? A lot of people have thought about these phenomena of day and night. One of them is Thomas Merton, Catholic priest. Many people may have heard of him. He was a Trappist monk, and at a certain point in his biography went into, um, what would he call it, not isolation, that sounds so negative, became a hermit, went off and lived by himself, didn't see other people for quite a long time. And part of his experience of that being a hermit, being alone, was developing his relationship with what he calls sacred time not simply the passage of hours and minutes and days and weeks, but how does time become permeated with the divine energy, with the godly energy? He was convinced that the hours of the day saturate you, that you become you know, saturated, permeated by this passage of time, the passage of the hours, the coming of the light, the waning of the light. One of the best things that happened to me when I became a hermit was being attentive to the times of the day. When the birds begin to sing and the deer come out of the morning fog and the sun comes up, 
the whole thing boils down to giving ourselves in prayer a chance to realize that we have what we seek. We don't have to rush after it. It was there the whole time. And if we give it time, it will make itself known to us. There is a sense of the unfolding of mystery in time, a reverence for gradual growth. Giving ourselves in prayer, you could say meditation, in contemplation, in spiritual practice of any kind, giving ourselves a chance to realize that we have what we seek. Also one of those mysteries of time, that we have what we seek. It's there already. Kind of reminds you of Waldorf education, doesn't it? Waldorf doesn't put things into the children, but brings out of them what is in there already. And this practice of time, of allowing yourself to be saturated by the passage of time, can awaken these realizations or this knowledge within us that is already there. The unfolding of mystery in time. Allowing things to grow as well as brooding and studying and thinking. That's all important. Brooding is important. Thinking is important. Studying is important. But it's not about gaining knowledge. It's about unfolding what is within us. That, I think, is one of the primary functions, if I may use such a word, of the Holy Nights, is to allow these many deeds that we have done throughout the year, allow that in a way to unfold in our memory, to pull the essence out of the past year, to say, oh, that happened, that was wonderful, or oh, that happened, how sad. Hmm, how can I do that better next time? Or for the good things, how can I increase the validity and the strength of those deeds, those things that actually went well? The brooders among us, of course, have a harder time with this one than those who have the more sunny view of life. But that's also a reason why we can do these things together. I'm not a brooder, so I do appreciate the melancholy folks around who once in a while will pull the raging horses down and say, wait a minute, but that was... Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Sorry. The unfolding of the mysteries in time, a reverence for gradual growth. A reverence for gradual growth. And I don't know about you, but when I first ran into anthroposophy, 40 years ago, I thought all I really had to do was read the philosophy of freedom, and then I would I would be there. I would I had been at a conference in Germany, and every five minutes it seemed like somebody was referring to the philosophy of freedom or the um one of the other major books. But this philosophy of freedom, that that's it. That's gotta be so there was a book stall. I bought a copy of the philosophy of freedom, sat down under a tree, and then midday break and read about five words and fell into a deep sleep. And when I woke up from the deep sleep, it was probably only five minutes later, I thought, oh, did I finish the book? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I've only, oh. Well, in 2013, I finished the book for the first time. So I don't know what I got out of starting the philosophy of freedom, but what awoke was this ultimate curiosity of what is in that book and what is it that this author has to say to the world and of course that has gone in 25 different directions got me where i am today be sitting here with you folks here in the in the room and all of you online to be wondering about the qualities of the day and night little biography there merton giving ourselves in spiritual practice the chance to realize that we have what we seek. That what we seek is already within us. We have to give it this gradual growth, reverence, mystery.
In the same essay, a rabbi is quoted named Abraham Heschel, who describes sacred time in contrast to sacred space. Any of you who work in the religious world have encountered this idea of sacred space, or dedicated space. You say there's a particular room, a chapel, a church, a meditation chamber, but that's all we do there, or that's primarily dedicated to sacred, to spiritual undertakings. And spiritual time, or sacred time, is something we're looking at today. The higher God of spiritual living is, not, excuse me, the higher goal of spiritual living is not to amass a wealth of information, but to face sacred moments. To face sacred moments. Spiritual life begins to decay when we fail to sense the grandeur of what is eternal in time. Again, not amassing information, but to become awake and aware in these sacred moments, which can come at any time. Those of us who try concentration, meditation, prayer, have often noticed in those moments it seems like nothing is happening. I'm not making any progress. I'm just where I was last week or the week before. But then you walk like across the street here and you run into someone in the parking lot of the supermarket that makes some kind of remark or asks you a question. And an amazing encounter can ensue because you've been doing that concentration work for the last 25 years. Now, that's the way it works in my humble experience. But do keep concentrating and contemplating and meditating and praying. It's very important. So what is it about the day and the night and the in-between? Rudolf Steiner has this wonderful characteristic of saying, life can be seen in two ways or three ways, or four ways, or seven ways, sometimes even 12 ways. I happened into one of his lectures where he says, life can be seen in two ways, day and night. And when the day comes along, we are outside of ourselves. We are involved in whatever it is we're doing. We're going to our work, we're taking care of our children, we're cleaning our house, we're cooking, we're outside with our consciousness. Our waking consciousness is involved with the world around us. That's the, can be the quality of the day. It's light outside. It's not so light here, we have electric lights on, but basically the sun shines. Light is permeating the world. Not so much in Europe, if we have anyone there, and I don't know what the sun is doing in Australia, if it's rising or quite yet. The quality of the night, on the other hand, when the sensory possibilities wane, it's less, of course, here in the city, it's more difficult to have that experience. But if you're in the, in the countryside, you can have the experience of real darkness where you can look up and see the stars. You can see some of the smallest constellations and planetary uh, configurations. And we tend to go within at night. We enter the world of sleep. I'll say some more about that in a moment. We let go of the world around us and the world outside of us, hopefully. that's. Kind of an art in itself for some of us is to let go of the day past and to give ourselves over completely in sleep the sun is up in australia by the way thank you the evening can be well suited to activities that are more reflective we tend to have a branch meeting at night or a study group or other 
interesting activities can take place in the evening, partly because we're working during the day. And there again, we have that match with the character of the daylight that most people's work takes place. At this point, I'd also like to honor the doctors, the nurses, the firefighters, the policemen, and all those other folks that do work at night and in the evening and during the day. Thank you very much. Much appreciated that you're there if someone needs you. So this quality of the night as the, as it were, renouncing to a great extent the outside world and coming within. And especially when we enter the world of sleep, that we spend a lot of time with ourselves. Another coming up, coming up. So I have a delightful little book here. And I see the person who gave it to me is, is uh, taking part in this gathering, but I won't embarrass her by calling out her name. Gave me a book put together by a woman named Ruth Gindler, Changing Light, full of poems about day, night, twilight, sunrise, sunset. I'm going to go on a little journey through this poetic world of this Ruth Gendler, who herself was a visual artist. She tells about her experience in, with the day and night in that she, as much as I do, live here with a house oriented east-west. So she could be in her eastern meditation room with the sunrise and could experience how the darkness slowly gave way to the light. The sun becomes slowly visible until it is completely, as it were, dominating the, the landscape. And if she would go on the other end of her house, the west, she could have the complementary experience in that the light slowly begins to wane. It doesn't get dark all of a sudden. She lives in San Francisco. It's a, it's a gradual darkening. And she could, she could be at work in her back room or painting or writing. And slowly but surely, the quality of the air, the quality of sound changes along with this waning of the light. These are all things that one can develop an awareness of, this change. Recently, I had the experience of traveling from Tucson, Arizona, to New Orleans. That means you have to traverse that huge state called Texas. That took me two days. And the second, it was the first day crossing Texas. I woke up at five o'clock in the morning, completely awake. I thought, well, there's no more sleeping going on. Let's, let's just hit the road. Completely dark outside and heading east, or my next goal was Austin. I had this beautiful experience of the horizon all around, no buildings, very few lights, pitch dark, and then slowly, slow. I could I could experience every moment of, because you're all you're doing is looking into the looking into the horizon, paying attention to the road. Yes, I did too. But, you know. And just the magnificence of our world, if I may even say that, the slow change from dark, 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 black or into the indigo, and slowly but surely along the horizon, then this, as we say in our Advent prayer in the Christian community, this bow of color that spans the sky it was literally 360 degrees all around. It was different in the West than in the East. It was more, vis and more vivid. In the East, the color, this first is pink, came up and the pink rose and then came a, 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 a band of blue underneath. And this becomes more and more saturated with the sunlight. Eventually, it's the whole eastern sky was kind of pink with the blue uh, border. And behind me, it was the same phenomenon, but much more kind of like one of our veil paintings you'd see in an anthroposophical setting. It's very gentle transition from 
blue into pink, and then finally the whole blue sky appeared. And it was about 9.30 in the morning by then. So between 5.30 and 9.30, if you can be anywhere where you have a clear eastern horizon, it's a fantastic experience. I don't know if that's particularly particular to this time of year. This was about um, two weeks ago, very beginning of December. Those are some of the things that you can actually see and experience. So a few contributions from the world of poetry. An Italian poet, Diego Valeri, lived in the last century. Evening spreads across the sky. Shadow that's still light penetrates the light that's already dust of shadow. It's evening. The lost color of evening, the human face of evening, the fatal sweetness of evening. There comes another theme, shadow. Where there's light, there will be shadow, especially if there's something in the way. Shadow that's still light penetrates the light that's already dust of shadow. Here we have such a picture of the transition, transformation. Shadow that's still light penetrates the light that's already dust of shadow. This light has already become something else, dust of shadow. I assume an English language poet, Patrick Miller, born in the second half of the last century, or with the title, Early Darkness. Think of it as ink, an indigo dye descending between the leaves of the trees and down to the grass. There is no dying of the light, just the washing of a bowl and overturning it for the night. When day arrives, we must write with bottled darkness. In the night, we can dream free messages of light. There is no dying of the light, just the washing of a bowl and overturning it for the night. What an amazing bringing together of this almost cosmic image, the indigo dye descending between the trees and the grasses, and then this bowl that you've washed and turned over so it's dry tomorrow when you need it again. Just think of the great creator turning the heavens upside down so that they can turn back from the activities of the day and regenerate themselves at night. I think that's what we're supposed to be doing too at night. Turning ourselves upside down, as it were. Remind me of that later. Not quite done with that one. Any of you who've studied the anthroposophical literature about sleep, of course, have encountered this picture that Rudolf Steiner says again and again and again. The physical and the etheric body remain in the bed. The higher bodies leave those bodies behind and enter the world of the spirit, our soul body, our spirit body. I have to see if somebody else, nobody else? Okay. That our higher being enters its homeland, the world of spirit, and goes through certain experiences there during the night. And a poet, I doubt if this person ever heard of anthroposophy because it was a Japanese poet in the 10th century, but he may have been tuned in to this particular phenomenon, I don't know. On a night when the moon shines as brightly as this, the unspoken thoughts of even the most discreet heart might be seen. And on a night when the moon shines as brightly as this, the unspoken thoughts of even the most discreet heart might be seen. One wonders if this was a full moon, 
know there are some statements about that that I haven't been able to find recently, but that this particular cycle of the moon waning, waxing, full, new, these do not just send the same forces to the earth as the other phases. Each one has its own particular function in this interchange between the moon and the earth. It's not our topic, but it does come up quite a bit. And then our very own Walt Whitman also wrote something that makes me think he had some inkling of this experience of the night. This poem also has a title, A Clear Midnight. This is thy hour, O soul, thy free flight into the wordless, away from books, away from art, the day erased, the lesson done. The fully forth emerging, silent, gazing, pondering the themes thou lovest best, night, sleep, death, and the stars. The free flight from the wordless, the flight of the soul, from the wordless, away from all of these things you've been doing during the day, books, art, lessons, fully emerging, silent, easing, pondering the themes thou lovest best. And then come the great themes, night, sleep, death, stars, free, Free flight into the wordless. I should stop now and not waste any more words, but I have a few still. Flight into the wordless. This is written by the poet who wrote poems with these very long lines. He used lots of words in his work. So he honors the wordless as well. And just... One more part of a poem by Kathleen Rain, an American poet who died not too long ago, I don't know, maybe beginning of this century, I'm not quite sure. This also has a title, Kathleen Rain. In case anyone is writing this down to look it up later. Nocturne. Night comes, an angel stands, measuring out the time of stars. Still are the winds, and still the hours. It would be peace to lie still in the still hours at the angel's feet, upon a star hung in a starry sky. But hearts measure another beat. Each body, wingless as it lies, sends out its butterfly of night with delicate wings and jeweled eyes. And some upon day's shores are cast, and some in darkness lost. In waves beyond the world, where float sometimes, somewhere, the islands of the blessed. An angel stands, measuring out the time of stars. Again, this relationship of the earthly human being to that part of the cosmos where we can say, those are the beings who watch over us, the angels. Whether she had a comprehension of a personal guardian angel, I don't know. I'm going to leave it at that as a question. An angel stands, measuring out the time of stars. And then it would be so peaceful to lie still in the hours at the angel's feet upon a star hung in a starry sky. Just imagine that place that you could enter, a star hung in a starry sky, but hearts another measure beat. So it sounds to me like there's work to do once we get into that realm of the angels. It's always a little ironic when someone dies and everyone says, oh, may he rest in peace. And I always think, mm -mm, there's no resting in that area where this person is going. I like to say, 
blessings on their path and all the things they have to do. Kathleen Rain, Nocturne, Walt Whitman, Clear Midnight. The Japanese poet was, I have no idea how to pronounce this correctly, Izumi Shikibu. And then we had Early Darkness by Patrick Miller. Then another one without a title, Diego Valeri. And this reliance on the artists for my experience as a non-artist, this allowing the artist to speak or express themselves always indicates to me that these folks have a have capability of reaching into that realm of the unseen or the unheard or the unfelt, whatever the art form may be, and bringing something of that quality into earthly manifestation, whether it be words or music. And I have at least two artists sitting in front of me here, so I'm being careful what I say. There are more of you on the screen. But that is my impression. When I read a poem like this and I allow it to, to kind of bubble in my imagination and um, savor the sounds and imagine the pictures that the poet had in front of him, it is a way of connecting to another world. It may be their world. It might be part of the spiritual world. I'll leave it for everyone's own ideas. So now I'm going to do something. I don't know if there are any colleagues of mine on this call. I might get in trouble for this, but I'll do it anyway. As many of you know, I'm a priest in the Christian community. And Riddle Steiner gave five sets of lectures that are thought to be the exclusive interest of the priests, but they are all, all available. They're all out there. Um, one of them, the last one, the lecture cycle on the apocalypse or the, the uh, revelation to John was given almost 100 years ago, September 1924. And in the first two lectures of this, of this cycle, he, where can we see if anyone's coming? Ah, there. The first two lectures of this cycle on the apocalypse, Rudolf Steiner gives yet another ordering of time. Most anthroposophists are familiar with old Saturn, old Sun, old Moon, Earth, and so on, or the Atlantic periods, post Atlantic periods, India, Persian, and so on. And especially, in, I've never run into this division of time anywhere else especially for these women and men who had been working as priests in the Christian community for two years at that point. He gives, an, at their request, a lecture on the, of the revelation to John. And he begins by talking about four ages of the mysteries. Ancient mysteries, half ancient mysteries, half new mysteries, and new mysteries. Very strange designations, these half old mysteries, or, but that's the way he talks about it, literally translated from the German. Alte Mysterien, Alt Alte Mysterien, Alt Neue Mysterien, and Neue Mysterien. And he says about this ancient mystery period, there are no remnants. It's untraceable in the outer world. There are no written records. There are no physical, there's no physical evidence of this, we have to take his word for it. So I leave that up to you if you want to do that or not. I do, it makes sense what he says. But he digresses first just a tiny bit to say that even in ancient times, people were always trying to figure out how to understand and how to penetrate the passage of time. Whether it was sacred time or time needed for planting and growing and harvesting, 
or hunting and fishing and gathering. Human beings have always attempted to understand the course of time to make to make um, a kind of an overview so that they knew what to expect in the next week or the next month or whatever they were calling it. They would have had different designations than we do. And he says, in all of these attempts, people have worked mostly with the cycles of the moon, because that was the, the most visible planet. You can see the waxing and the waning and the full and the new. And have noticed, well, that's about so many weeks, and there are so many times between the time of, let's say, um, planting one year and growing and harvesting and the snow and the cold and the return of the light. But there are always 12 to 14 sun days, not Sundays, but days related to the, the sun, that didn't quite fit in any of these systems. And they usually relegated those odd days to midwinter, when often if the further north you go, the more snow would be on the ground, the more inaccessible the outer world was, the more um, related they were to their in indoors with a fire in a cave or in a house, or in a hut, wherever they might be. And at this particular time, when almost no outer activity was possible, people began to notice that the quality of their sleep was different, the quality of the conversation could be different. And he reveals then in this lecture that one of the things that was going on, not necessarily in broad view of, in broad daylight, in view of other people, were these ancient mysteries which were being celebrated by people ordained to do that. We would say priests or shaman, people of that, of that nature. And that these rituals would take place underground, in a rock cave, in the, in the mineral world. And it was through these rituals, which he doesn't describe in, 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 a, in any nearer sense of the word, that earthly substances were transformed into spiritual substance and then saved for the rest of the year so that at certain times these substances could be distributed to all of the people who wished to receive them. He only speaks of water concretely and then substance, substantiality of the earth. You can understand whatever we can from that, whether it was bread that we think of now in churchly practice, whether it was some other substances, we don't know. He, he's, these are very, very, very scanty indications that he gives. But the, the point was that this took place in this spared time, these 12 to 14 days in midwinter, underground in rock, cave in this, this surroundings in which he says the priests then felt themselves to become one with the substance of the earth around them. They were not only in this closed space, but they became part of the earth. And in becoming part of the earth and then enacting their rituals, the substantiality that they had in front of them was so infused with spirit energy that it would could be distributed to other people throughout the year. So I just admitted some of them. See if I can do that. I'm not left handed. There. He's gone. Or he's in. Interesting, we talk about the ancient mysteries, and here we get to play with a very modern gadget. So then you have the, I'm not going to go through the whole, the whole, uh, that would take us probably till about five o'clock this afternoon, to go through the, the three other mystery periods. But just imagine this one taking place in the dead of winter, underground, by very few people who had gone through an extensive training, 
who had developed these powers of uniting themselves with the being of the earth in order to bring the spirit into matter so that this particular material was so transformed that even a small amount could be given to other human beings throughout the year. And he spoke of this time as when the gods would descend out of the spiritual world and unite with human beings directly. Just imagine some being, however we would perceive that being, I don't know, would enter the room and would be present among us, visibly, audibly, and communicate with us as priests underground in this underground cave. That was a very special time, and it could be that this feeling that we still have in our time, that these holy nights have a special task, that that has its origins in such practices. And again, I can't give you a time indication. It does sound like the half-old myst mysteries would have been probably the periods that we're familiar with in Anthroposophy as the old Indian period, the old Persian, the old Egyptian, Chaldean, Hebrew, and perhaps around the Greek and Roman period with the coming of Christianity, the half-new mysteries appeared. And as he's indicated many times in anthroposophical literature, we are in the age of the new mysteries. And it seems to me that the anthroposophical society and the movement and all of its many branches, Christian community, Camp Hill, we are all part of these new mysteries. Or we can say the gods no longer present themselves as blatantly as they did in the ancient mysteries, or even in the half ancient mysteries. They present themselves only when we consciously, wherever we might be, driving down the freeway, doing our work, cleaning our house, we can always lift ourselves, important word, lift ourselves into this realm. If we want to, if we can, it takes practice. The other aspect of the new mysteries is, for example, in the practice of the Christian community, nothing is saved of the substances that are transformed in the service. That is consumed by the priest afterwards. It's considered simply leftovers, and nothing happens with that. So that we can say every time we enact the ritual, it's new. In fact, one of the most shocking statements I heard at the seminary was we were getting close to our ordination preparations where you, you kind of think you know everything and I can do this. And one of the one of the teaching priests said, Well, and you know, folks, when you start the service, you never know if it's really going to work. I can see us all sitting there wide-eyed and beginning to shake and wondering. Where am I here? What, what kind of place is this? We're not sure it's going to work. And this particular teacher said, well, you're most likely going to speak the ritual all the way to the end, but you really have to be there 100, 150, 200 percent. Can't really quantify things like that. And I think this um, would go for anyone attempting to carry out a worldly activity in a spiritual way, that you always have to run the risk of, maybe it won't work the way I thought it would. It's not a, it's not a blueprint for success, any of the things. Not this lecture cycle, not the ritual book, not the Waldorf teachings. None of those are guarantee of anything. All they can do, as Thomas Merton pointed out, is bring out what is already there when we give it the time it needs. And so we can say for our anthroposophical work, every time we sit down with a meditation or a concentration exercise or study, I don't know where I'm going to be at the end of this exercise. 
if I thought I did, I probably shouldn't do it because I'd just be running things off like I don't know what, like going to the supermarket. I can usually be pretty sure I'm going to find milk and bread and cereal and things. Although recently, never mind. <laughs> Get off in too many anecdotes here. That's fine. That's great. That the things that are necessary, that they just show up. That if I ride my bicycle or I drive my car somewhere, I can be pretty sure I'm going to get where I'm going. But in the spiritual work, there is this aspect of openness required, which is also open to failure. And so I think that's another place where the Holy Knights come in, is that it is this kind of space that has no particular value. It's somewhat lost to the economic realms because all the money has been spent before Christmas. And it is a time when one can say, I leave the world behind for a while, maybe a few hours each day. And a beloved practice that I've been engaged in since hmm, 1980, maybe, or so, is spending each day of the Holy Nights looking back over one month of the past year. I have an appointment calendar and a journal, and that makes this exercise a little easier than if I were just sitting there trying to remember, because I read my journal last night in January, and I was reading something. Who is this person I'm writing? I've already forgotten. So imagine I'd been trying to remember January just on my own memory forces. I wouldn't have had much to go on. And of course, it's not only about remembering what was past, but also wondering, January 2024 is also coming. One can look very concretely in one's calendar to see, aha, I'm going to be teaching or working or traveling or doing this or going there or seeing this person. One can project a small bit and perhaps there's something in that past January that tells us, Craig, could have done better. Or you made a really stupid choice. Or you made a really good choice. It's, it's also possible to be happy about the past. It's not all brooding and, and sorrow. Now, I have the feeling when we do that, we are working with the substantiality of the earth in a very different way than the ancient mysteries did. They had very concrete items in front of them, and they worked in a very particular way, in a very particular spot, at a very special time. Quite exclusive, this, this, this activity. But the fruits of that activity, the transformed material, distributed itself, as it were, among the human beings gathered around. Whereas now we, in our time, we can still go to church and receive communion. I wouldn't forbid anyone to do that. In fact, I encourage people. But if we take the substance of our deeds of the past year, what is the essence of last January? What is the essence of last February, March, April? These are nothing special spiritual things these months, I don't think. It's just a way of ordering the time and also corroborating with the 12 days of the Holy Nights. It's a matter of convenience in a way. What was the quality of, of the summer? What did the summer do for me and what did I do for the summer? What did I do differently last year than I might have done in years past? How is the coming summer going to look? How can I transform the fruits of last year, possibly the disappointments or the imperfections? How can I build on those things that went well? And to me, this is very practical spirituality. It's not sitting and meditating and expecting that an angel is going to reveal something exciting to me. But it's actually looking very concretely of at acts of will and thought and feeling that went through my person into the world, and now they come back to me. 
in this reflection on the whole. I can retrieve them out of the cosmic memory or the whatever layer of memory that is where those things are preserved. And I can ask myself very concretely, what now? What now? One other thing here. Oh, I said that already. All right. Still someone joining us. <clears throat> ah, I've said everything I plan to say. So what do we do now? Master. <clears throat> It's a given state, if you know some poetry. So uh, please help yourself and uh, brace your electronic hands. Sorry. So uh, navigate your cursor arrow in the bottom of the screen. There is reactions. Click on And there is the ah, yeah, button. Yeah. So and you can do so. Or... If I can see you, you can raise your physical hands. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Don't be shy. Okay. Where can you reach the pen? Which mm -hmm. one? GPL Compostela. Yeah, that's me. Um, oh. Hello, I I just uh, don't want to be visible. That's okay. I'm here Hi. in Pittsburgh, and I was thinking of two things. First of all, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I was thinking of the great Greek um, language in which they distinguish between two kinds of time, chronos mm -hmm. and kairos, mm -hmm. so that we have chronological time, that flowing Thing about time and then this kairos which is qualitative in the moment time sort of one can see a kind of cross in those two qualitative kinds of time and I was also reminded as you were speaking of the great medieval mystic monk Saint John of the Cross in Spain who is locked in the tower in Toledo for nine months, literally nine months. And in those nine months, he has no way out, but in, you might say. And he writes what is to me, as a speaker of the Spanish language, the greatest poem ever written in Spanish about the dark night. So um. what happens in this journey not outwardly, but inwardly, and the meeting of, you might say, his higher self. Um, if you wait, I can get a translation that I took me 20 years to write, if you'd like to hear it, um, or we can leave it at that. Is that a whole book, The Dark Night of the Soul? You may not have no, time it's for a, that. It's a poem. Ah, all right. Yeah, it's we can go on and see if there's some other contributions and then come back to you. How about that? Okay. If, if you want. Thank you. Yes. So, Mr. Leon. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I, I wish I were there. Uh, anyway, um, you, you caused me to pull out a poem. Uh -huh. um, well, it's not really a poem, but it's to me, it's poetic. Okay. Um, I'm a biologist. I came to this country from England to study marine biology in Florida. And shortly after that, I came across this book by John Steinbeck. He wrote a book called The Log from the Sea of Cortez. It's really not a story, but it's the account of an expedition he took with his biologist friend who became one of the main characters in later novels. And it was a manual for how to how to run a, a scientific expedition on a boat. And 
the biologists would go through all the animals and plants collected and so on as one part of the chapter. And then at the end, Steinbeck would write up, up something else about his his uh, experiences about, with, the, with the trip. And this particular statement has been very important for my biological life because it studied biological rhythms and, and a lot of work in nature. And it goes like this. And it is a strange thing that most of the feeling we call religious, most of the mystical outcrying, which is one of the most prized and used and desired reactions of our species, is really the understanding and the attempt to say that man is related to the whole thing, related inextricably to all reality, known and unknowable. This is a simple thing to say, but it is the profound feeling it made a Jesus, a St. Augustine, a St. Francis, a Roger Bacon, a Charles Darwin, and an Einstein. Each of them in his own tempo and with his own voice, discovered and reaffirmed with astonishment the knowledge that all things are one thing, and that one thing is all things. Plankton, a shimmering phosphorescence on the sea, and the spinning planets, and an expanding universe, all bound together by the elastic string of time. Mm. Thank you. That was beautiful. Don Steinbeck is not the first one I would think of to write about no. spiritual matters. So it's quite refreshing to hear that from him. Thank you. I'm here. Thanks. Well, I don't see any other hands. Is Miss Compostela back with her poem? Oh, excellent. I am alive. Um, yeah, so this is St. John of the Cross, and we're talking about 1565 in Spain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, he is put in a tower for his attempts with Santa Teresa from Avila to renew the part of the religious life of the Catholic Church at that time. So he's dangerous because he wants people put it swiftly he wants people to be aware of prayer and the power of prayer so mm -hmm. he's locked up in this tower he's given very little to eat maybe only crusts of bread very little water he only has on you know uh, a, a sort of toga so this is the eight stanza poem that he writes of course he doesn't have anything to write it on but when he's discovered afterwards after he is able to escape um he writes this down in the dark night, with fear and stirrings of love in flames, O oh, precious desire, I left unseen all my senses in repose. Dark and sure by the secret ladder, O oh, precious desire, dark and inspired, all my senses in repose. This night a mystery, no one saw me, nor did I see outside my only light and guide, the one that in my heart burned. Light more certain than the noon, my heart, my burning, guided me to where no other waited, only the one I knew. O night that guided, O night sweeter than the dawn, O night that united, beloved with the lover, the soul in spirit self transformed. My flowering breast that entirely for him I kept, there he slept and there I sent, cooling air with wafts of cedar scents. Wind from the turrets when I parted his hair, his calm hand on my neck fell, wounded from his caress, all my senses ceased, stopped. I forgot as I moved to rest my head on his chest. I, among white lilies out of mind, freed, no worries left.
Wow, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's quite a it's quite a work of art. Of course, the Spanish is much more beautiful. If, if we have time, I could recite that as well, but it's maybe too much. <laughs> yeah, not enough Spanish speakers here probably to appreciate it. I see that Robin or Christoph have raised their hand. It would be Robin. Uh-huh. So Steiner also had two places that he talked about this light and this weaving with the souls. It was in the mystery plays. Mm -hmm. The first one, the portal of initiation at the end of scene three and at the end of scene seven where Benedictus talks about these, this light and the power. And I thought maybe I would read just one of the two. Sure. Um, this is the one from the end of scene three. Light's weaving essence radiates through far-flung spaces to fill the world with life. Love's blessing pours its warmth through time's long ages to call forth revelation of all worlds. And messengers of spirit join light's weaving essence with revelations of the soul. And when with both, the human beings can join their own true self, they are alive in spirit heights. Thank you. So we've had an ancient and a modern idea about the weaving of the light. Very good. Looks like we might be finished. You want to make announcements about future events? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. You're correct. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Very poetic and uh, beautiful language. Yeah, thank you. And uh, dear friends, I would like to invite you uh, for the next presentation, which will be in two days on 28th. It will be presentation by Andrew Linnell, uh, my good friend. And his presentation is Redemption of Cain. So now please feel free and mute your computers and uh, lively. Say thank you to Craig meeting. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Craig. All. I really Thank love that. You. Thank all you. Thank right. you. appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and so many blessings for the Holy Nights to you, Craig, and all that are here. This was beautiful. Thank you so Thank, much. Thank you, Robin. Many greetings to Minnesota. Where it's way too warm. Oh, uh, <laughs> you rarely hear Minnesotans complain about warmth, but all right, just for now. Thank you, Craig. You're welcome. Craig, I really appreciate uh, the suggestion of how to work with journals in the months. That's I'm going to try to do it. I love it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you, Craig. Most helpful. Oh, you're welcome. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Thank you. All right. Good. Okay. Thank you. Have a good holy night. Bye-bye. Awesome. Thank you.